thank you, Zohar. Zohar asked me uh, to the uh, conference uh, to speak about current issues in U.S. Uh, bankruptcy law, uh, specifically related to corporate law. And um, so the, the ongoing uh, hot topic in American uh, bankruptcy law with corporate bankruptcies is the continuing rise of asset sales where a company files for bankruptcy and sells all of its assets uh, to a buyer rather than undergoing a traditional reorganization. So I'm gonna talk about that uh, today. Specifically, there's four points I wanna cover. First of all, I'll just summarize some of the data showing that asset sales are continuing to increase and displace traditional reorganization in, in American bankruptcies. Um, then I'm gonna show, uh, present some evidence that suggests that creditor recoveries, uh, recoveries for the creditors of the estate may actually be lower in these asset sales uh, than in a traditional reorganization, and this is problematic. Uh, it would affect companies' cost of capital if it's true. Uh, to the extent we have lower recoveries, there's a pretty good explanation as to why there's an incentive problem having to do with the incentives of the managers who are selling the companies uh, and selling the assets specifically. Uh, and then I'm going to suggest at the end how some simple improvements to the auction procedures, the way companies are sold, uh, the bidding procedures could correct some of this uh, incentive problem. So first of all, talking about asset sales. Uh, before 1993 uh, about, essentially all large US corporations, so public corporations think of 100 million or more in assets, that's most of the data that I'll be uh, talking about today. If they filed for bankruptcy, they either liquidated, which basically meant they shut down, uh, or they were reorganized under Chapter 11. Now, my understanding is that the Chapter 11 reorganization is a uh, distinctive type of bankruptcy procedure uh, uh, for the, uh, or, or associated with the United States. That, for example, in many European countries, when a company goes, files for some kind of insolvency proceeding, liquidation basically is the only option. And increasingly, however, other countries have been adopting something like the American Chapter 11 procedure. I know that England did something about 10 years ago, and Italy about eight years ago. Uh, but I, maybe ironically, just as other countries are moving toward the American model, America's starting to move away from that model. Uh, uh, so the traditional model, it, just to uh, summarize what a Chapter 11 renegotiation, <clears throat> excuse me, reorganization is, is that the company files for bankruptcy, continues operating, the managers continue to run the company and they negotiate with their creditors basically a, a certain amount of deleveraging. Some amount of the debt is gonna be converted to equity that's gonna solve the insolvency problem that's gonna come out uh, of bankruptcy. Starting in the mid-1990s, however, many cases instead involving large corporate debtors have been resolved through a going concern sale. All the assets are sold off to a buyer. Uh, either under a confirmed plan or under Section 363 of the Bankruptcy Code. The proceeds of the sale, if there are any, are distributed to creditors, and, uh, and that's, the end of, uh, that's the end of the proceeding. So this is a chart showing the rise in these types of sales, going all the way back to the beginning of the current Bankruptcy Code, creating Chapter 11, uh, first full year would be 1980 up to 2013. Uh, there's a lot of uh, bouncing around, but the general trend upwards uh, is in, this is the percentage of large public companies that are undergoing one of these asset sales rather than a traditional reorganization. Um, and uh, Faye Taloni, who is actually an SJ student, SJD student at Fordham, has written an interesting paper showing that sales are even more frequent since 2005 uh, when there were some amendments to the American Bankruptcy Code that put more pressure on management to resolve the case, uh, to resolve the case quickly. So why did sales suddenly start happening in, uh, uh, instead of uh, and start displacing traditional Chapter 11 reorganization in the mid-1990s? Well, nobody really knows completely for sure. This is a bit of something where we were observing it as academics and we didn't have a uh, full answer. We have theories and we have a partial explanation, which I'm about to offer, but it's only partial because it raises the, the question, which is what caused the phenomenon I'm about to describe. But essentially, starting about the mid-90s, Companies, when they started getting in financial distress, uh, did something differently than they had done before. Previously, they would weather it and maybe file for Chapter 11. Now what they do is they have one kind of final chance at surviving by taking on new debt uh, and giving this new creditor, because the company is in distress, giving the creditor a senior lien, a first uh, secured lien on all of the assets. 
uh, sometimes people call this the gambling for resurrection uh, approach, where you take one last chance, you borrow one last big pile of money, uh, and you invest it and hope that's going to turn around the company. If it does, great. If not, then you're going into uh, chapter 11, you're going into bankruptcy with a senior secured creditor who has a great deal of control over how the, um, how the proceeding uh, is run. And this senior secured creditor, or it could be a syndicate of secured creditors, think bank, something like this, have incentives for a quick, uh, quick resolution of the case. They don't want a long, drawn-out chapter 11 uh, chapter 11 reorganization. Why not? Well, think especially if they're oversecured. You're the senior creditor, and you think the company is worth more than, uh, than what you're owed. You just want the case to resolve quickly. You're going to get paid uh, in full either way, but delay uh, can create risks for you. Uh, and so the idea here is a creditor control theory. Creditors are increasingly pushing for these quick resolutions, uh, and so this may be caused the rise of 363 sales. Also, um, there is, uh, it's much more difficult for a company once it's in bankruptcy to get, some people say dip financing, I find that it's undignified to say that, so I call it DIP. Same thing, uh, debtor in possession, uh, lending uh, more cash to run the company in bankruptcy. It's actually hard to get approval from the bankruptcy court if there's already a senior secured creditor. So often it is the senior secured creditor that serves as the DIP lender, but this control over the cash flow creates more pressure on, uh, on management. Um, so these were just some of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the changes in 2005. Uh, these were statutory changes that made um, uh, sales even more common. Congress decreased the exclusivity period, the amount of time that managers have to get a plan approved. Um, more claims are now treated as administrative rather than uh, unse general unsecured claims, which means they have to be paid in cash. There's gr uh, greater power now in American bankruptcy for utilities to turn off the power, turn off the water supply unless they get a certain reassurance. Um, and uh, more pressure on debtors now since the changes in 2005 to assume or reject commercial leases quickly. All of these changes put time pressure and money pressure on management. It's not clear that Congress was intending to cause more sales to occur because of these changes, uh, but that, uh, that has been the effect. So what has a, how do these 363 sales, this is what they're commonly called, uh, or you can call them going concern asset sales, how do they work in practice? So the very standard procedure that has uh, emerged, uh, about 85% of cases follow this uh, two-phase procedure. Phase one is debtor's management signs what's called a stocking horse agreement uh, with one potential buyer. Uh, and uh, this specifies which assets are going to be sold, the price, uh, usually it's for cash, uh, and also sets out auction procedures for uh, phase two. Uh, the term stocking horse. Um, this is my first time to Israel. I don't know, do people hunt a lot here? Is that a big pastime? No, okay. So I, I guess probably, I, it's, a hunt, it's a hunting term that uh, apparently when you're hunting ducks or other birds and you want to sneak up on them, uh, and they will recognize a person, and so they'll fly away, but they're calmer around horses. So there's a horse that you hide next to when you sneak up on the ducks, and then at the last minute you pop up and you shoot them. Uh, it seems like cheating to me. Anyway, what does this have to do with the stocking horse agreement? Well, the idea here uh, is that all of the other bidders are going to bid against the stocking horse. So the stocking horse is going to offer itself uh, uh, as a way to get the, uh, the auction going. So then in phase two, there is an auction where other parties are invited to come and bid and offer more for the company's assets than is specified in the uh, stocking horse agreement. Then the stocking horse is allowed to uh, rebid. Um, the debtors' manager, managers have the final say on which of the prices, which of the offered, uh, offered deals is the best and highest, uh, and then that is approved by the, um, by the bankruptcy court. Now, here we see a break from Delaware law uh, that I think is pretty severe. We're talking about here bankruptcy judges, so this is federal law. Um, it would seem strange, I think, to say to, uh, to a Delaware judge, look, Your Honor, there are two offers on the table. This particular person's offering a higher price, but I think the lower price is actually better for the shareholders. Um, it's very hard, as, uh, as uh, Ted Murphy said earlier, it's very hard in that kind of situation uh, to defeat, uh, to prevent an, an, an injunction from being issued. But the way these uh, sales are structured, it's the, there's, there's, uh, there, there's uh, 
a comparability problem. Sometimes one person is offering all cash, another is offering cash, but also is going to assume particular debts of the debtor. And so management can say, actually, we need these debts assumed because we need to make these creditors happy to continue to have a viable kind of uh, going concern. And once you have this comparability problem, it's not just dollars to dollars, apples to apples, the judges often feel like they have to extend more deference, and so we have something like a business judgment rule uh, being, a business judgment standard of deference being extended here as well. So, second part of the talk, here, major point I want to talk about is how credit recoveries appear to be uh, lower uh, in these, in these uh, sales than a traditional reorganization. So, getting back to kind of some of the efficiency considerations more broadly. Traditional Chapter 11 reorganization has been criticized. First of all, it often takes a long time, which can lead to high administrative costs. That means lawyers' fees. Uh, uh, so, uh, and so also sometimes there are absolute priority violations where uh, creditors would be paid in full, but, but equity holders would still get some value. Asset sales were seen as the great hope to, uh, to fix this. Expenses are, in fact, lower in asset sales. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's bad news for the bankruptcy bar uh, uh, because there's less money paid to the attorneys. Uh, uh, but absolute priority violations also essentially never occur. But there is a dark cloud uh, uh, in the silver lining. Uh, at least one study has found, it's for, it, I haven't seen anyone credibly refute it, that in your cha standard Chapter 11 reorganization, Creditors recover, what they actually receive is about 75% of the book value of the company, whereas in a, ch a going concern asset sale, it's only 29%. Uh, so big difference. Um, and this would, under normal circumstances, drive up the cost of debt for corporations uh, and their overall cost of capital, unless we have reason to believe that they are defaulting less now on their debt than they used to. Uh, but that evidence, controlling for relevant factors like lower interest rates and so on, uh, hasn't been uh, established. Why would, these, um, why would these, uh, these recoveries be so low? Well, there's good evidence that these sales procedures aren't particularly uh, competitive. So typically, uh, once the stocking horse agreement is signed, uh, the, the, the firm will then ask about 80 companies to be potential bidders, to come and bid, try to outbid the stocking horse. Only 30 potential buyers even bothered to sign the confidentiality agreement, which would allow them to do the due diligence to see if they want to bid. And then only one, on average, 1.6 bidders actually bid, and that 1.6 includes the stocking horse, uh, which means that in 58% of sales, there is only one bidder in phase two. So phase two is, to some extent, illusory. It's really all decided in phase one when management decides which particular uh, firm uh, is going to buy the company. There's some factors that would discourage uh, competitive bidding. There's a breakup fee. It's an average of 2.3% of the stocking horse price. So the stocking horse receives 2.3% uh, if it loses uh, uh, the, the, um, the, 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 uh, the bid. This obviously is effectively a tax that any other winning bidder would have to pay. There are minimum bid increments. And as I mentioned, uh, deviations from a strict apples to apples comparison gives management some discretion uh, to select the uh, highest bidder. Um, so, uh, stocking horses actually prevail. The original phase one uh, person, uh, buyer prevails in 85% of auctions. That's the current data. So, there's some incentive problems that we can identify that may be contributing to these uncompetitive, uh, what appear to be uncompetitive auction procedures. Um, Many times, the uh, stocking horse is the senior secured creditor, so the creditor is exerting a lot of control. As I mentioned earlier, lacks incentive to arrange a competitive auction, especially if it's oversecured, and said the preference is speed, so it can pressure management uh, to do something quickly through cash control. What about the managers, though? Remember, under, under the American system, the managers are still running the company in bankruptcy. Their pay packages don't encourage them to maximize the total sale price, but what they do have an incentive potentially to do is to try to select a bidder who will continue to employ them uh, once the assets are, are purchased out of bankruptcy and the company continues. So, so this is, uh, you can find somebody, as we all know from uh, great corporate cases, a, a buyer who is friendly to management is called a white knight. So we have white knights in bankruptcy as well. The white knights here are riding stocking horses, so we can really get going with the equestrian imagery. Uh, but that's, uh, this could be an incentive for management. And so this interferes with the incentive to maximize creditor returns. 
Also, judicial oversight at the bankruptcy level isn't at the bankruptcy court level isn't particularly strong. I don't say this as a critique of the American bankruptcy judges. I, I think that the circumstances are such that it's difficult to review. Often they are presented with an emergency situation. Whether the emergency is real or, or it's artificial isn't clear, but the parties will go and say, Your Honor, you have to approve this sale within 15 days or the stocking horse is gonna walk away, won't buy the company, and then we're going to be in a free fall situation. Also, uh, let's say an unsecured creditor objects. Is th these auction procedures, I don't think they're fair. One thing the stocking horse can then do, the buyer can then do, is say, well, I'll just assume your debts. I'll pay, repay you in full. This would be a violation of the general rule that all unsecured creditors should be treated the same. But once that creditor's debt is assumed, they actually lose standing to object uh, anymore. So the squeaky wheel gets greased and uh, nobody else. Uh, and so in this way, the adversarial system seems to be undermined a bit. Um, there has been uh, talk recently of about a, a Delaware, uh, sorry, excuse me, there is another Supreme Court in the United States, um, the United States Supreme Court, we've been talking about Delaware so much that I forget about the other secondary one, uh, that's right, uh, so this other Supreme Court um, in, uh, in, in, a, in a little jurisdiction, Washington, D.C., decided a case, Radlax, 2012, that had to do with the rights of secured creditors to credit bid. This is a fairly arcane-sounding term, but what it means is if you're a senior, uh, secured creditor, you can bid at an auction not by offering cash, but rather by saying, I will accept the assets uh, in satisfaction of my debt up to the amount of my, uh, up to the amount of my bid. Um, debtors didn't want to give this uh, credit bidding right because it was seen as giving uh, the secured creditor a lot of power. Now, academics like me were puzzled by this at first. We thought, why should credit bidding matter, the right to do it or not? If the senior secured creditor can easily borrow, we have a liquid capital market, then we just borrow the bid amount, pay it. Then when the sale is over the next day, those sales, those, that cash comes back to the secured creditor uh, because the secured creditor has owed the proceeds. And, and so it's, uh, it's just, a, just a minor transaction, uh, minor transaction cost. But as a practical matter, this the credit bidding really does matter. Uh, and one of the reasons is there's delay. Uh, when the sale occurs, cash is put in to the bankruptcy estate, uh, but up to on average, uh, so on average, these 363 sales after the sale, though that's quick, another uh, year or two can pass before the, the case is finally resolved. And during this time, if you bid cash, the cash is basically in limbo. Uh, this, is, uh, this is actually longer than your standard chapter 11 not outside 363 sales. So this aspect was uh, unexpected. Here the sales seem to be a little bit slower. Uh, than traditional reorganization. While that uh, has happened, while cash is in limbo, uh, the debtor may bring an action against the secured creditor saying, this lien that you're claiming, this first lien on all the assets isn't valid, and I'm gonna use some of the cash you just paid me to, lit to litigate against you. Uh, and so this is a reason why uh, credit bidding uh, may have been important for secured creditors. Anyway, the Supreme Court has now established that they always can credit bid. So this will make even, uh, give even greater power uh, to senior secured creditors to drive, uh, to drive these sales uh, going forward. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is just how maybe some better auction procedures could align incentives a little bit better and maybe get higher returns to creditors than we've been seeing so far in these, uh, in these sales. Now we think about it from a theoretical perspective. Think about incentives. Let's say you're, you're the senior creditor and you think you are undersecured. You think that the assets of the company actually uh, aren't worth as much as you are owed. Do you want a competitive auction procedure in that case? The answer, I think, is yes, right? Because let's say you're owed $200 and you think the assets are only worth $100. If the auction procedures are not competitive, you'll just get the assets for $100. But if the auction procedures are competitive and somebody else thinks that the assets are, set, let's say, worth $105, you want that person to come along and bid because that person will pay $105 and then you'll receive the cash and you think $105 in cash is worth more than what the assets are worth. So we should see, when creditors think they're undersecured, uh, uh, competitive, uh, more competitive sales. This is undermined, however, by the delay problem that I mentioned earlier, how the sale may still take a long time. Uh, so the suggestion would be uh, that uh, bankruptcy courts should commit themselves to, after a sale, having a very quick 
uh, uh, summary hearing on whether the lien is valid, because that's really the only uh, relevant legal issue in a case like this. If it is, then immediately rece uh, releasing the cash to the creditor. That should help. The bigger problem is going to be when you have an oversecured creditor. So flip it. You uh, are owed $100, and you think the assets are worth $200. Now you don't want a competitive procedure, right? What you want is nobody else to show up to the auction. You credit bid your $100, and then you get all the assets, and you get a windfall because you've just received $200 worth of assets. So here's where the incentive problem is uh, real. Uh, a couple conditions could be put on the credit bidding right that I think would make auctions more competitive in this uh, context. First of all, the creditor should allow uh, more cash financing for enough time to, uh, to uh, permit a competitive auction uh, rather than having a rushed procedure. And this can be done by just saying to the creditor, if you don't allow adequate funding for the, bank, for the debtor, then we're not going to allow you to credit bid. And also, uh, in terms of uh, managerial incentives, it seems that managers should receive, the debtor's managers should receive some kind of cash bonus for uh, the sale price, but only to the extent that it exceeds the senior creditor's claim. Uh, that gives an incentive to have a competitive auction when the creditor is oversecured. Finally, a point that I haven't seen made uh, uh, d enough discussion about, this notion of a breakup fee. We all know that a breakup fee given to the first bidder is usually conceived as compensation for some kind of due diligence, some kind of research that they have done to get the, uh, to get the auction going. Uh, either in the bankruptcy uh, context or in a control contest uh, outside bankruptcy. But it seems to me that if the stocking horse bidder, uh, who is, the senior, is also the senior secured creditor, then that creditor already did significant due diligence when extending the loan in the first place. So the marginal additional cost of being willing to buy the assets is probably very small. And we know that these breakup fees discourage competitive bidding, so maybe they should be Court should consider disallowing them for stocking horses that are also senior uh, senior secured creditors. Just some suggestions on the way to make the bid uh, the bid procedures more um, more uh, competitive. Uh, so um, what I've told you in conclusion is that asset sales are an increasingly important aspect of American bankruptcy uh, law. Um, tens of billions of dollars a year are changing hands under these procedures. They're unconstrained by uh, by statutory text. Chapter 11. I think the bankruptcy code's as far as statutes go, makes pretty good reading. It's very beautifully written. Uh, the Delaware General Corporate Law is uh, right up there, uh, also, uh, with a great statute. Uh, and uh, much better than um, thing, anything Congress has done recently, for example. Lots of procedures with respect to, lots of rules with respect to Chapter 11, relatively little with these 363 sales, because nobody thought this section was going to be used as an alternative, as a new way to reorganize uh, companies. And so judges have been making rules kind of in a uh, common law way in the absence of statutory text, but because the adversarial process is broken down, we're not getting the procedures that address all the, uh, the, the incentive problems. Uh, so judges could address by adopting some standardized procedures that cr try to increase the incentive to get higher recoveries uh, in these sales. Thank you. Avramivel. A partner at uh, Fischer Bacher Hen, Vel, Orion.